Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Colin O'Connor, Custom Content Editor at Genome Web. The title of today's webinar is Single Cell Spatial Analysis, Insights and Innovations in Disease Research, and it's sponsored by Nanostring. Today, Dr. Dulai will discuss his work in inflammatory bowel disease, IBD, for which understanding the spatial cell um, landscape and single cell interactions are critical for resolving disease mechanisms and guiding drug development. Dr. Parambir will outline considerations when utilizing single cell spatial platforms and highlight the relative strengths of applying these technologies to study IBD. And with that, I'll hand over to Parambir. Take it away. So I'm going to talk about benchmarking uh, spatial platforms for IBD. But before I get into that, I want to acknowledge two specific people, uh, Yuan Luo, the Chief Artificial Intelligence Officer at Northwestern University, and Yiming, a postdoc in his lab. Both of them have been instrumental in this collaboration for all of our spatial data generation. And so I just want to make sure I acknowledge them for the data that I'm about to present. So inflammatory bowel disease encompasses both Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis. It's a relapsing, remitting autoimmune disease of the GI tract. Um, it is pathogenically uh, sort of a function of an aberrant host microbe interaction and immune epithelial responses to those exposures. And so you can imagine the spatial environment becomes extremely critical for understanding disease processes. This is a rather prevalent disease and over 3 million IBD patients in the US suffer from it. And it is an expensive disease with over $25 billion spent annually with the majority of that being spent on biologics and small molecules targeting the immune system. But the efficacy of them is only 30%. And so we, there is a critical need for drug discovery and drug development. This is a reference atlas that was published in 2019 that really helps define the fact that there is huge heterogeneity in immune cell populations in ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease. And this heterogeneity is a, a major factor for that heterogeneity and treatment response. And the single cell work that's been done to date has been instrumental in a lot of our biological discoveries. So when you get into the spatial environment though, this is a major gap in the IBD space because all of the dissociated single cell work has not been able to put this in context. And why that's relevant is there's a huge drop off in oxygen tension as you get to the epithelial layer. And that mucosal hypoxia, dysregulated angiogenesis and cell-cell interaction that occurs in the microenvironment is extremely important for understanding biology in IBD and helping to really drive discovery. But before we can really embark on understanding how spatial biology becomes relevant for IBD, we do need to understand how the platforms perform and how we can really optimally leverage the growing technology to understand the disease pathogenesis. So what we decided to do is we wanted to do an exhaustive benchmarking study to really define performance characteristics for the two major platforms in the space, Cosmix and Xenium, on IBD samples in our data set and in our cohort. So we ended up using 11 unique patients with 16 blocks, FFP blocks. This is a mix of ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease, ileal and rectal biopsies. And you can see that we had at least five patients who had paired samples from the ileum and rectum. We ensured we included a range of disease activity and treatment exposures to create variability in sort of demographics and heterogeneity in patient populations. But what we wanted to standardize was the workflow for how these blocks were collected, prepared, and run on the machines. So we have a standardized biopsy collection protocol at our institution and in our biorepository with standardized fixation time and embedding processes. And for this project, we wanted to ensure we used whole block sections on slides to capture spatial diversity. Um, the intra-sample variability and inter-sample variability were two important aspects that we wanted to make sure we captured, but we didn't want variation in block preparation to be a major contributing source of data variability. Um, the blocks were then prepared at our pathology core um, by a single pathology technician with over 20 years of experience with, with slide preparation. Uh, for either patho sort of investigator-initiated studies or even large clinical trials. We said, made sure that we had identical microtome settings, and then the blocks were cut with sequential slides, the first one being for H&E staining, and then the next two being specifically for cosmics and xenium. The most important thing we wanted to do here is we wanted to make sure that samples were prepped immediately after cutting. So the cosmic slides were immediately sent to my lab for preparation, 
Um, and the Xenium slides were immediately prepared and sent to the Northwestern University Sequencing Corps, which is a certified 10X genomics vendor um, and service provider for Xenium spatial profiling. This has been something that's been variable across prior benchmarking studies, and we know that delays in sample preparation have some impact on data quality, but for our project, everything was run fresh, and we made sure that it was prepped immediately. Um, for both platforms, we use the multi-tissue panel. In Cosmix, that's the 1K multi-tissue panel, but without the custom spike-ins. And for Xenium, that's the multi-tissue and cancer panel, again, with no spike-ins. And for both instruments, we did whole sample FOV placement. The uh, other thing that we did in our study is we did have a quality assessment by our pathologist just to try to understand whether the H&E images could be used to screen data quality. Um, and then post-run, we actually used the residual FFP blocks to look at RNA quality to understand if that may help explain any data variability that was seen. For the comparisons, we really limited the comparison between the two platforms to the 119 overlapping genes between both panels to make sure that it was fair and consistent. But we will talk more broadly about the performance characteristics of each instrument. So really the five things we wanted to get into were differences in plex size and the importance this has for biology. And we'll talk about that as we talk about overall data. Um, I really want users to walk away with an understanding of the difference between transcript counts and transcript diversity, and then means and medians in dealing with skewness of data. Uh, we'll get into cell segmentation and cell size between the two platforms, and, and really want to remind you that we're using the overlapping genes for performance comparisons. And then we'll talk about how you can think about using block quality as a way to screen before running on platforms. So looking at the COSMIC's overall panel coverage, you can see here, um, when you look at the overall transcripts, the mean transcripts per cell, you're getting in our data set an average of about 150 with a median of about 150. So there is some skewness to data, but there is variability and you can get some FOVs that get up into the thousands. Um, and when you're looking at unique genes uh, per cell, you have a mean of about 120 and a median of about 107. So again, some skewness in data, but good diversity in representation with, with really good counts per cell and unique genes per cell. When you look at Xenium, overall, we had good coverage. Remember, it's about a third in terms of the number of total genes that are detected. So when you're comparing means and medians, you want to take that into consideration. Overall, the Xenium had about 45 mean transcripts per cell, but a median of 28, so some differences in skewness. And for unique genes, it had a mean of about 20 and a median of about 17. So a little bit less skewness in terms of gene diversity. The first thing we wanted to get into was we did end up using that large single cell reference atlas to annotate cells using the entire plex to understand how the plex size may influence cell annotation and typing. And what I'm providing to you here is two examples of the Xenium versus Cosmics comparison for annotation. In sample one on the left and sample three on the right, you can see that the Xenium tended to have far more epithelial cells represented. But across samples, there was variation in the proportion of cells that were annotated to be epithelial, whereas for cosmics, there was a little bit more consistency. Um, and this Surratt-based annotation using a reference uh, matrix from that single cell data set did sort of result in some variation for Xenium, not quite as much variation for cosmics, presumably because of the larger plex size. Getting into that cell annotation process, you can see here that the two platforms use different genes to annotate the same cell, cell type. And in Cosmics, you can see the panel there that annotated that absorptive epithelial cells. And on the right heat map, you can see the specific genes that Xenium ended up using to annotate those specific components. So they do use different genes to define the same cell type. And that's why plex size and gene diversity are going to be really important and impact your accuracy for annotation and typing. And we saw this to be most notable for the minor cell types, so the subtypes of T cells and some of these other larger cell populations. Getting into that cell size component that I mentioned earlier, so both platforms have differences in how they annotate cell boundaries. Cosmix uses a membrane marker, whereas Xenium currently uses an expanding boundary marker. Um, why that's relevant is because you want to make sure that the cell size is appropriate and accurate so that transcript assignment can be considered to be um, appropriate for that cell size. So when you look at sample one and sample three, again, as examples, you can see on sample one um, that when you look at the components of the 
um, Cosmix data set, the CD8 T cells are annotated here. And when you look at the other one, it's annotated here. And it's pretty similar in terms of upper bounds of the cell size. But when you look at Xenium, the cell size for CD8 positive T cells across the two samples is quite different. And for Xenium in particular, you have some populations where the upper bound of the cell size is quite beyond what you would typically expect for that cell size. And so that expanding boundary did result in significantly larger cell size annotations for Xenium uh, than Cosmix, but this wasn't consistent across all samples. And I'll get into why that might be the case. So getting into the sort of comparison between the two, I wanna orient you a little bit on what we're looking at here when we look at the comparison for transcripts and unique genes. Again, this is limited to the overlapping genes between both platforms, which is 119 unique genes. Um, on this axis, you'll have the Xenium data. On this axis, you'll have the Cosmix data um, in terms of the transcripts per cell and the median unique genes per cell um, on the right. The top set, of graphs is overlapping genes with no correction for cell size. And then the bottom set of graphs is overlapping genes and then corrected for cell size to see how this might influence data quality. Um, anything that's on this line um, is where both platforms performed equally. And you can see when looking at median transcripts per cell, there were three tissue blocks where both Xenium and Cosmix had identical data. But the majority of samples, um, the Cosmics outperform Xenium in terms of median transcripts per cell. And then when you get to look at gene diversity, um, the Cosmics outperform the Xenium on almost all of the samples for median unique genes detected per cell in the 119 overlapping cells, overlapping transcripts. When you then normalize it to cell area, you can see that the Cosmics still outperform the Xenium on the majority of cells. Um, for median transcripts per cell, and then also for median unique genes per cell, you can see that the majority of the samples uh, in light green, Cosmix uh, identified more median unique genes per cell when normalized for the cell area. So overall, across all the samples, when you look at it, Cosmix did outperform Xenium, but there are some samples where Xenium performed comparable or maybe slightly better. When we get into why that might be the case, um, for 10X platform Visium, it is recommended that you do a DV200 screen. So we actually wanted to look at our tissue blocks and do a DV200 assessment to see if this may be related to variation in Xenium data quality. And then for the first time, really look at whether this has any relationship to the Cosmics data quality. And what you can see on the top row, which is all Xenium uh, data, uh, the mean transcripts per cell and the mean unique genes per cell there is a linear relationship between DV200 and data quality. And just to highlight for you, um, sample one was the one that had very large cell sizes. Sample three was the one that looked a little bit more biologically appropriate. And you can see that this is related to the variation in the DV200. Um, and similarly for median unique genes, you see this linear relationship between DV200 scores and data quality on Xenium. For Cosmics, you really don't see this um, across the DV200 scores in terms of any relationship. And so it appears to perform more consistently, but perhaps at the higher DV200s, the two instruments look to be comparable. But in our data set, that wasn't the majority of samples that had a high DV200 score. So in summary, Cosmics higher transcript gene diversity compared to Xenium across all the samples. Cosmics did result in more consistent cell typing and cell segmentation. Um, I highlighted why that cell segmentation is important for accuracy so that you can have appropriate assignment of transcripts for biology. Um, we outlined why plex size dump does become important both for annotation purposes and discovery. When you look at the data quality in terms of mean or median unique genes or total transcripts per cell, you can see that Cosmix performs more consistently across samples irrespective of the RNA quality as measured by the DV200 scores. Um, but among higher qualities, both plat quality blocks, both platforms seem to be comparable for performance, again, in overlapping genes.